Yes, so I want to talk about something which a good deal of my co many of my colleagues would regard as, as uh, sacrilege, perhaps. The idea that there should be anything before the Big Bang. Well, I should say it's actually worse than that because um, the title, as you know, has another word in it, too. So we're saying something, in fact, something serious was going on before the Big Bang, which is pretty sacrilegious in uh, modern cosmology. So the question is, is all this crazy? <laughs> and the answer is yes. But it does say something about various problems of cosmology. Well, one of the big things I want to talk about is the second law of thermodynamics. There are these things referred to as dark energy and dark matter. Notice I put quotes. That means I don't really much like the titles. Dark energy in particular. And dark matter, people tell me it ought to be called transparent matter. It's not really dark. But uh, nevertheless, there's something there. And the black hole information paradox does feature quite strongly. And the structure of the microwave background, cosmology has now become a very precision science. It used to be thought of something you could wave your hands around and say anything. But uh, since people have now got fantastic observations of this microwave background, which I'll be saying thing, something about, uh, it, it raises also problems, the information contained in this radiation. And finally, well, I put down the word inflation with a little cross at the end. Inflation is something which has become part of modern cosmology, and I'm trying to argue that it's not there. So uh, I'll just leave you with that list for the moment, and I'll say some things about at least some of those things in the list. I probably won't get around to everything there. Uh, but there's another issue which is very important here. Just a minute. Let me get myself organized here which is, is it true? Well, next the uh, <laughs> I'm going to say something about this at the end of the talk, but as you can see, it's, uh, well, you can see I'm not going to answer this one, but uh, there will be some things at the end, if I get to the end, which uh, have something to say about that issue, and which are uh, somewhat intriguing, but I won't say any more about it right now. But let me first say something about earlier ideas, uh, which, you see, the idea that something should have gone on before the Big Bang is not all that new. Um, this example here is one of the standard cosmologies, uh, the first solutions of Einstein's equations to treat cosmology were those by Alexander Friedman, a Russian mathem mathematician and physicist, and uh, he uh, solved the equations uh, in a cosmological context. And one of these is a model which is, I should explain that in most of my diagrams, time is going up the page. So this is a space-time picture. And you think of time as evolving like this. And the universe, of course, I have to throw away a few dimensions usually. And in this case, I'm throwing two away so that the spatial geometry is represented by this, well, think of that as a circle and it expands with time and collapses, and then it keeps on going. Well, you see the equation that describes the radius of this uh, spherical universe, or hyperspherical universe, is actually gives you a cycloid, and the cycloid is a curve traced by a circle rolling on a, a point on a circle rolling on a line, and this keeps repeating itself. So you might think that this model the, the, here is your Big Bang, you see, and then it collapses, and then there's another Big Bang. It used to be referred to as an oscillating model. Nowadays, we like to think of just one cycle, because you can't see quite what to do with these singularities. Another problem with this model was that it didn't seem to... Ha it seemed, there seemed to be a problem with the second law of thermodynamics, which is one of my topics over there. Second law of thermodynamics says that a thing called entropy is increasing with time, and so how does that sort of keep on increasing when the universe seems to be repeating itself. Tolman uh, introduced an idea, a, a model in which this didn't quite repeat itself and these cycles it kept getting bigger, which did to some degree uh, accommodate the second law. Uh, but it's really not doing it in a serious enough way, as we shall see. Other models, 
due to, well, Wheeler suggested maybe the constants of nature changed with each cycle. And Lee Smolin had idea that you branch new universes out of black holes. And there are some other models which involve things of this general nature. These all involve string theory ideas. And uh, I'm not going to involve any string theory. You might be relieved to hear. Um, but so these are ideas which I'm going to talk about will not have anything like string theory, no higher dimensions. We're only talking about three dimensions of space and one of time. Again, you might be relieved to hear that. OK, let me not talk about all these other models, except I'll just say that the, one of the driving ideas is to have a model in which the geometry really does work. Whereas in these models, you have trouble, as we'll be seeing, trying to fit one cycle onto the next really creates all sorts of serious problems. Anyway, I'll leave that one there for the moment and <clears throat> describe the standard cosmologies. These, these, in fact, are models due to Friedman. Uh, and they, there are basically three different models. The one I just talked about over there, where the universe is spatially closed, so you see the section through it. The, the spatial geometry is something closed up. Uh, whereas there are two others which are open. These are characterized by a number called k, which is basically the spatial curvature, which could be positive, in this case, 0 or negative. And before I get to the ones underneath, let me say something about these three kinds of geometry. They're well known to mathematicians. But uh, if you want to describe these ideas to the general public, it's rather handy that the De Dutch artist M.C. Escher had these very beautiful representations of these three kinds of geometry. So here we have the, uh, I guess it's the other way around according to that picture there, but never mind. I suppose I could do this, but then my inequalities <laughs> didn't work so well. Well, it's still all right, but the K is the wrong way around, isn't it? So I think, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, here we have the normal Euclidean geometry. So the K equals zero case, the spatial geometry is at least on average flat just like Euclid's geometry. And here we have something like a sphere, where it's all closed up. But think of it as a higher dimension, so it has to be a three-dimensional version of a sphere. And here we have what, to me, is the most interesting case, the negatively curved case. That's the one um, over here, where the expansion is more rapid, if you like. This one just, just doesn't recollapse, but this one just keeps on going, uh, never even slows down, ultimately. But the geometry is nicely represented by this thing. Well, this is referred to as the Poincaré representation of hyperbolic, hyperbolic geometry, I suppose for the reason that it was discovered by Beltrami. But uh, <laughs> it's, I think if I call it the Beltrami model, people will think of some other model, which was also discovered by Beltrami. So that's a little bit of a problem. But it's the conformal representation. And that's the point I want to concentrate on here. What I want to say is that the whole of the spatial universe, this is actually a two-dimensional spatial universe, but you could do the same thing in three dimensions, where the boundary was a sphere, and the entire universe was represented inside. <coughs> this is an infinite universe, so the devils just keep on going and going, and the angels keep on going and going. Uh, but you have to imagine that if you were one of these devils, or if you prefer an angel right down here, you would think the universe looked just the same as one of the ones in the middle. Now, you see there's a certain amount of distortion, but the distortion is of a very special kind. It's of a kind which is called conformal. So that if you take very small shapes, or the, small, the smaller they are, <coughs> the, better the, rep the better the representation is, very small shape, say the eye of the devil, then it's almost exactly simply expanded or contracted. So when you get to a, one of these devils down here, the eye shape would be almost exactly the same, except that it's, it's uh, uniformly contracted down. So you have, well, another way of putting it is that the angles in this geometry are correctly represented in the background Euclidean geometry. And that's what we mean by a conformal representation. But what is nice here, and this is the point that I really want to stress, is that the entire infinite universe is represented in a finite region where infinity is this boundary. Now, the infinity boundary here looks like a, a circle. Of course, if this was a three-dimensional case, the infinity would be a sphere. So if you 
were some, one of the inhabitants of this universe and you took a walk, you would seem to slow, slow down and never get to this boundary. It would, to you, appear like somewhere out of infinity. But we, looking at this from this Euclidean perspective, can think of the finite boundary and you could take a step right outside. So if you uh, respected the geometry of the Euclidean space instead of the uh, hyperbolic space, um, then you could simply step outside to some a region here which isn't part of the universe. So I want you to keep this in mind because this will actually play a good role in what I want to say later, that infinity can be represented by a boundary which as far as the conformal geometry is concerned, that is the geometry which respects small shapes, infinitesimal shapes or angles if you like, but it doesn't respect the size, so small and big are sort of equivalent, that geometry uh, you can somehow extend it beyond infinity. So keep that in mind, because that will be something rather important in what I want to talk about. Now, I said I'd say something about the second law of thermodynamics, so let me say something about that. In fact, I want to talk about what I'm calling the mystery of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law consists of a the part which is totally unmysterious and a part which is totally mysterious. Now the totally unmysterious part is what does the second law say? Well the second law tells us that a thing called entropy, and the entropy roughly speaking is a measure of disorder, that is increasing. So things get more disordered. And you might say, well that's pretty obvious, isn't it? We all know that. Uh, things just do get more disordered. Well it's a bit more serious than that, but uh, yes, that's what happens. But why is there a mystery? Well, I want to say a little bit more about that. Uh, in fact, I've got two versions of what I want to say here, depending upon whether you're a physicist or not, I suppose. So one version is the non-physicist version. Here we have, uh, well, a cartoon of some sort of everyday occurrence. You have to imagine this is, say, taking place according to the laws of Newton, where you have little particles constituting what's going on here and forces between the particles and uh, you can imagine everything is carrying on in, accord in accordance with Newtonian dynamics. Now one of the features of Newtonian dynamics is that it is completely reversible in time. So all the laws, if you run the clock backwards, they work just as well backwards as forwards. Now here we have something which is in accordance with Newtonian mechanics a glass of wine perched on the edge of the table and it jiggles and it falls off and the wine gets absorbed into the carpet and the glass smashes and so on. Now this is something which if you ran the clock backwards would be just as in accord, just as much in accord with Newtonian dynamics, say this first, this second, this third, as the more everyday this first, this second and this third. However, we never see things where the glass somehow spontaneously assembles itself and the wine uh, jumps out of the carpet and into the glass and sits onto the edge of the table. You might worry about where the energy comes from, but it all comes from the random motions down here. There's no problem with energy conservation. The problem is something else. It's with entropy. This thing, measure of disorder, uh, is something which increases with time, and this uh, reverse process uh, is not something you experience. A way of putting this in ordinary language, what is entropy? Well, there's a definition, a wonderful definition due to the Austrian great physicist Boltzmann, who said that, roughly speaking, entropy is, the measure, is a measure of the number of possible ways of assembling the given mass, macroscopic state, including all the motions, out of sub-microscopic ingredients and it happens to be the logarithm of that number of ways. Now, you see, you have to imagine that a situation like this, say, or that, um, there's a lot of air here and there's a lot of fluid in the glass, and you might say, to, to talk about the dynamics, you would need to know exactly how every particle is moving, where it is, how it's moving, what the nature of that particle is, and so on, what the chemical compositions and so on, everything like that. Um, but you need to know every single particle to be able to do the Newtonian mechanics. Whereas uh, you, all you would 
really know about a situation like this would be averages. You'd know how the, what the temperature is, what the pressure is, what the general direction of flow, and things like that, what the chemical composition is, but not in detail where every particle is. So we have on the first hand the, well, the, the sub-microscopic state of all the actual details of everything, and secondly, what you really see here, which is the macroscopic parameters. It's a little bit vague, but never mind about that. Uh, if you know the macroscopic parameters, then there are many different ways of constructing that macroscopic state out of sub-microscopic states. A huge number, you take the logarithm of that, and that is the entropy. Well, there's a thing called Boltzmann's constant, which goes into it too, but that doesn't matter. It's basically that. So you take the logarithm of a number of ways of producing the macroscopic state out of sub-macroscopic possibilities. And the log of that is the entropy. So it's really a quite a simple idea. And then you have a thing called thermal equilibrium, uh, which is the maximum entropy state. I th should make a point about this, and that is that very tiny changes in entropy will tend to correspond to absolutely stupendous changes in this number of ways of doing it. So uh, the entropy somehow gives you a kind of, doesn't tell you the, the actual s stupendous change in the number of possibilities. Now you see, I, ha I told you I'd have a physicist uh, version of this uh, slide, which is basically the same situation, but we have to talk about phase space. I'm not going to waste time talking about this, because if you're a physicist, you know about it already, and if you're not, you'd, it would take me too long to explain exactly what phase space is and everything. But you have this thing with these coarse graining regions, so the Macroscopic space state is described by a region where all these little sub-macroscopic states uh, look the same, but uh, they actually are in detail different. And the argument is that the, a slight change in entropy will re result in an absolutely stupendous change in these volume sizes. So this means that almost all the, the paths will tend to go through increasing uh, entropy. Now, uh, that's the sort of natural thing. So I said there's an, there's an obvious part to the second law and a, and a mysterious part. And the obvious part is that almost all the uh, future behaviors are going to have an increasing entropy. So here I've plotted entropy this way, time this way, and so that's what you would expect. The trouble is, what happens when you try to go the other way and say, what is the most likely way that this glass could have found its way on the, the top here? And you try to use the same argument, and you see, well, by far the most probable way is that it started as a great mess on the ground like this, and the, all the wine uh, suddenly collected itself together, and the glass, all the bits of broken glass, stuck themselves together, and the wine jumped into the glass and perched itself on the edge of the table. That's by far the most likely way that that glass came up in the corner of the table, just by the same argument. And then you would retrodict that the entropy went back up into the past like this, which is completely wrong. Of course, what happened is that somebody who'd been drinking a bit too much of this stuff had rather put it up rather bit sloppily on the edge of the table, and that was something where the entropy was actually going up previously. So this argument is fine if there isn't something else going on which, hasn't, which is non-random involved in this. And so there has to have been. And if we look at this picture here, I'll take the physicist's picture because I haven't got it on the other side. Um, that this curve of entropy you have to trace back and back and back and you see why, well, there's got to have been some very huge constraint on what the entropy was at the beginning. And that constraint was the Big Bang and so on. So we have a, a problem here. Why is it that the entropy, if it was going up into the future, must have been going down in the past, and so it must have been very, very tiny in the past. And so there must have been an extremely special state in the past. Now, there's a little bit of a problem here. The problem is, what do we know about the Big Bang? Why do we even believe it's there at all? One of the most powerful pieces of evidence for the Big Bang is this thing called the microwave background radiation. This is uh, well, it's an incredible observation and confirmation of the existence of this highly condensed hot state, which is this radiation which is often referred to as the flash of the Big Bang, which is observed. And the thing is it has, well, its temperature is about uh, 
uh, 2.7 degrees absolute, which is pretty cold, almost absolute zero, but it was hot at one time and the universe expanded and the expansion cooled it down to what we see now, about 2.7 degrees absolute. So this is, uh, um, well this is a curve here showing you the, uh, at, at different frequencies you get different intensities. And this follows very closely this Planck curve. This is the famous curve that Max Planck uh, explained and started quantum mechanics off, if you like. Uh, and this um, is a very specific mathematical shape. Now, the, the little error bars here refer to the observations, but the, uh, in order to plot this thing here, the error bars have been exaggerated by a factor of about 500. So you see some of these look pretty, the errors look pretty big here, but you've got to remember it's exaggerated by a factor of 500, so you've got to squash that down by a factor of 500. And therefore every single point of observation fits to the eye right on the curve. So what we have is an absolutely incredible precision, much better than any other observation in physics of, of a Planck curve in physics, out there in space, and that's telling us you see, this is frequency up this way, and this is the intensity for each frequency. So that's what it is. Out there in space, we have this source of radiation, which seems to have been coming from thermal equilibrium. You see, that's the basis of the Planck calculation, if you like, that you're looking at matter and radiation in thermal equilibrium. But then you have to remember what thermal equilibrium, equilibrium is. It's the maximum entropy state. So there seems to be a bit of a paradox here. You go back and back and back to the earliest stage of the universe we know. Well, it's, actually it's not the earliest because this radiation is about 300,000 years after the big, big Bang, but it's still referred to as the flash of the Big Bang. If you go back earlier, you can't see it because the radiation doesn't get out. So it's when the universe became transparent, essentially. So, uh, but what you see is that when you go way back there, you see something not small entropy, you seem to see maximum entropy. So what's wrong? Well, I think I've never quite understood why cosmologists don't worry more about this. Um, and I think one of the reasons has been that they say, well, the universe was pretty small in those days, and therefore there perhaps wasn't much room for much entropy. Well, that's just the wrong argument. Because if you have reversible laws of physics, when you go back, you can't uh, increase the number of degrees of freedom. Um, so that doesn't, uh, it doesn't explain it. The real explanation is that what you're looking at here is not the whole story. What you're looking at is radiation coming from matter and radiation in equilibrium. Yes, that's right. That's what this is telling us. But that is actually not the whole story. The, the microwave background is actually telling us something else about the nature of the universe in the early stages, which is not shown in this curve here. And this is the fact that when you look in the different directions, you see almost exactly the same temperature, to something like one part in 10 to the fifth or something like that. Almost exactly the same temperature all the way around. And that's telling us that, OK, you're looking at something which is spatially extremely uniform. So it's, what's that? What's the importance of that? Well, spatially in uniform, is telling us something else about the uh, initial universe. And let me show you some more cartoons. This is now um, here. Just a minute, where did I? If you have a gas in a box, this is the sort of thing that people tend to talk about in terms of the second law. You, the, the gas might be start off by being tucked up in a corner where by some little walls or something, and then you remove the walls, and it spreads out like that. So this represents an increase of entropy. This irregular looking initial state smooths out and becomes which looks very uniform. And that corresponds indeed to an increase of entropy. But suppose these were not gas molecules, but gravitating bodies. They could be stars or something like that. And then there's a, a, an opposing tendency, which comes from gravity, for these things to clump. So that whereas this is still increasing entropy, the picture looks very different. 
And so you have something uniform becoming less and less uniform, whereas here we have something non-uniform becoming more and more uniform. Both represent increases of entropy, but the effect of gravity from its universally attractive nature is such, to, such as to produce a, a, something which looks very different. And what, in fact, we see in the early universe from, first of all, the microwave background, this curve, telling us as far as the matter and radiation is concerned, yes, it looks like this. And as far as the uniformity of this radiation is concerned, you're looking, again, like something, well, like this and this. It looks uniform. It looks like thermal radiation. It looks uniform. But you see, that means that it is small entropy with regard to gravity and large entropy with regard to the rest of it. So that's what you're seeing, a combination of those two things. And the gravity is easily the most important part of this. Or you might say uh, it's, it's what we live off, in fact. It's, it's absolutely crucial because um, here we are living off, uh, well, you see people think of the fact that we get energy from the sun, but that's not the crucial thing because the energy that we get from the sun goes back again. OK, we get global warming, so we are actually being warmed up. But that's a, from this point of view, it's a small effect. Of course, it's something to worry about from other, other points of view. But here we have the radiation in the daytime coming in from the sun. It's doing it now. And particularly at night, it just all goes back again. So we don't get energy from the sun. But what do we get from the sun? Well, we, what we get is the fact that the sun is a hot spot in a dark sky. And a hot spot, that means that the photons tend to be, on the average, much more energetic than the ones going away. That's the Planck thing again. And the individual photons, by Planck's formula, E equals h nu, the individual photons have to be more energetic. They have a higher frequency, and therefore they're more energetic individually. Therefore, there are smaller number of them. So there are fewer photons coming from the sun and many, many more infrared photons carrying the same amount of energy away again. So we have small number of degrees of freedom here, large number of degrees of freedom here. That means the energy spread out over more degrees of freedom. That means the, that the entropy involved here is much higher than the entropy here. And the plants are clever enough to convert these low energy photons to high energy photons and use the the, the reservoir of low entropy that's involved there in building up their substance. So that's, and then we eat plants, and, or animals that eat plants, and so on. And so this is, this is uh, how we stay, keep alive. We don't keep alive by taking energy, because if we did, we'd just get fatter and fatter. Do you want to just stop for a sec? Because we have a second microphone. Oh, <laughs> oh all right. Save your voice. And yes, well, it. whatever you think. Yeah, we can try it. It's, uh, I Oh, I see. It's one of those. Do you want a pocket to put this well, in? Well, leave that there. Oh. oh, we need that as well. Oh, yeah, okay, yes, all right. Yes. <laughs> as long as they don't start interfering with each other and squawk at us. Here. Yes. Can we stick it in there? You can, yes. Okay. And this just and goes this over your ears. That goes over your ear. All right. Uh, Herbs. Is that going to be okay? Yes, it doesn't need to be there. Can you hear me at the back? Or aren't they supposed to hear me yet? Well, <laughs> Take a breather. <laughs> mm, okay, take a sip of water. Do you want to try it again? Can you hear me? Is it making any noise at the, at the back? Okay? I think you're good. Is that working? I hear no complaints from the back, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> yes or no? Is it good? Getting better? A little bit more volume. Not as far as good. Now that's wonderful, yes. You can hear that. <laughs> That's the other problem, is what starts squawking. Let me just, okay, I think we're... Is that, can you hear me? No. You didn't hear me say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think maybe you just continue to speak loudly, and I think... Yeah. I'll, do, I'll do my best. If, I, if it makes it go squawk, I'll have to... Well, I'll speak reasonably. Is that, can you hear the words back there somewhere? <laughs> I won't get through to the end if I do that. <laughs> OK, energy is conserved, but the entropy, uh, which is low, what we get from the sun, 
or the imbalance between the hot sun and the cold sky is what we get, uh, 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 that's what we make use of, if you like, in keeping ourselves alive. That sounds as though something more serious is happening. Yeah. Yes, I can see hands going up. Okay, fine. And the point is the, hot, the sun is a hot spot in a dark sky. And where does that come from? Well, all sorts of processes are going on in the sun, um, such as uh, thermonuclear reactions and so on. But the main thing, that the ultimate reason why the sun is hot comes from the fact that it's there at all, which comes from gravitational clumping. So you see, it's because the uniform, the distribution used to be uniform, like this, and as it clumps, you get things like stars forming, and they get hot, and they form hot spots in an otherwise dark sky, and that is what we live off. So it is this uniformity which is absolutely crucial to the universe as we know it and how we can exist in it. And how we have an, a, a second law of thermodynamics which we can live off, and it comes from this kind of process. Okay, well that's a big point I wanted to make. There is, however, another point here, as you see at the bottom of the slide. Black hole represents the greatest increase in entropy that comes about through gravitational clumping. In fact, uh, by e uh, easily the f largest entropy in the universe as we know it is contained in black holes in the centers of big galaxies, or big black holes in the centers of galaxies. So these actually are the big entropy, place where the entropy is gone. And easily the, the greatest part of entropy comes there. So, um, yes, we've dealt with that. So let me say a little bit more about a black hole. And here I have a picture of a black hole, or a collapse to a black hole. Again, remember, this is a space-time picture, time going up the picture. So here we have a, a body of star or something collapsing. And it goes inside this thing called the horizon. And this is a region, the event horizon, which is a region where signals can't escape. I'll have to explain that in terms of these things which I've drawn here, which are the light cones. They're a crucial part of uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. The main structure of the universe is given by these light cones. So let me say something about light cones. Here we have, these are things drawn on the space-time, if you like. Here we have a light cone. And if you, you can sort of think of that in terms of uh, a progressing time. So here we have now, that's a moment later, that's two moments later and three moments later. If you think of these sections through it represent moments of time. This is just a somewhat artificial concept, but that's how we like to think of things happening in the world. And the point here, a flash of light happens, and here we have a spatial picture of it. This has a better number of dimensions. I have to throw one dimension away here to draw this picture. Here we have the flash of light in the middle, and here we have the next moment it's, it's this spherical region surrounding the point, the next moment that, the next moment that. But you spread out all these spheres in time to give you a space-time picture, and that is the light cone. It's very important. It tells you how causal effects can operate in space-time. Here we have <coughs> a space-time picture according to special relativity, so there's no gravity here. The light cones are all uniformly arranged. And here we have a massive particle, uh, and that particle's world line, the world line is the history of the position of that particle, the world line has to be within the cone all the time. So here you see that has to be true, well, that special relativity, we have what's called Minkowski space, it's, but in general relativity the cones are more higgledy-piggledy, if you like, and we see an example of that here, with the light cones not kind of uniformly arranged, and they're tilting over in this way, which prevents signals from escaping from inside this event horizon. So if you have a, a particle here trying to get out, <clears throat> well, it can't, you see, because it's guided inwards by the cones, whereas things can fall through from the outside to the inside, but not from the inside to the outside. So you see this curious behavior of a, night, of a, of a black hole that things get trapped inside it. And the matter which produced the black hole is likewise trapped in the same way. And that all comes about from this tilting of the cones and the fact that 
massive particles have to have their world lines within the cones. Light itself, see here's a photon, that would go along with a line which is tangential to the cone everywhere. So you see that also in this picture with uh, light signals trying to escape. Well, they can if they start outside the horizon, but if they go inside, they fall inwards like that. OK, so there's a black hole. The point I want to emphasize here, though, is that this thing in the middle, this nasty thing there, is a singularity. This is a place where the curvatures of space-time become infinite, and the physics more or less has to give up. So uh, that's what black holes do to us. And we have to then modify our pictures that we had before. And before doing that, I should also modify my pictures by introducing the ones at the bottom. You see, these are the standard, original standard cosmologies, which in, are solutions of the Einstein equations with a zero thing called lambda, which is the cosmological constant. And most people who worked in general relativity didn't like this thing very much although some people used it. In fact, I've used it myself in discussions of things, although I'm not terribly keen on it, at least I wasn't. That was the wrong bet, because it turns out there is one. <laughs> or there's a thing which people who don't like it call it dark energy instead. I think dark energy, in my own opinion, is not a very good word, because it's not really energy. It's a funny, funny kind of energy. It's, not, it's really a cosmological concept. As far as we know, it is this number which Einstein in whenever it was, 1917, uh, realized could be incorporated into his equations. And he put it in for the wrong reason, thinking that he wanted a universe which didn't expand. And when it was found it did expand, he considered that to have been his biggest mistake, apparently. However, it wasn't actually a big mistake. It was a, a wonderful idea, as it turns out, because it probably is a cosmological constant, which is positive. And this has the effect that these models now are not what we believe the universe to be on the large scale copying, but doing something where there's this accelerated expansion which takes place round about now, I should say, which is rather remarkable because we're somewhere around about here. As we look out at the world, we see the universe is beginning to accelerate outwards. And it doesn't much matter which of these models it is, as the spatial geometry doesn't seem to make much of a difference. You still get this accelerated expansion. And this is an observational fact. Well, when I say it's a fact, there are a lot of people, there's still people who don't believe it. There's still some other reason for the effects. But there's lots of independent pieces of evidence since the original ones in 1998 by Perlmutter and Schmidt were separate, two different uh, groups uh, looking at distant supernova stars seem to see that the universe was actually accelerating in its expansion. And that is just the kind of thing you get from a positive cosmological constant. So I'm going to take that's what it is. We have a cos positive cosmological constant. Now, um, so that's one thing which modified my original pictures. But the other thing for the presence of this talk, at least at this point, is more important, which is that the models don't take into account the spatial irregularities. And when you do take that into account, you get these singularities in the future as well. You see. The black hole singularity is a sort of future thing. If you were unfortunate enough or stupid enough to fall into the thing, you'll see that in your future, you're sort of guided into this nasty thing in the middle. So that singularity is a thing that represents your future, and it's more or less the end, as far as you're concerned. Uh, so here we have these future singularities, and those are the black hole singularities. Now, the thing about this picture here is it's got the second law of thermodynamics fundamentally in it. That the Big Bang was a different kind of singularity from those ones in the future. It's one of these things, slightly ironically, because when people started thinking about singularities in the Big Bang and the, uh, and the black holes, in fact myself, these, the analogy between the two was often stressed. You see, you've got the Big Bang is like singularity in the past, the black hole singularities are like ones in the future. And if you can't get rid of one, you probably can't get rid of the other. And so that kind of argument was, was around. But in detail, they're very, very different. And this has to do with the second law. The second law, it's easiest to see, I think, if you look at the closed one, even though we don't believe that model is appropriate to the universe as we know it. 
I mean, if it's closed, it's like this, not like this. But if it were like that, you would have basically all these black holes coming together and producing an incredible mess of congealing black holes in the end. Not this nice, regular, smooth Big Bang that we seem to see. What the cosmic microwave background tells us is a nice, very regular thing all the way around. Nothing like what this would have been, say, if you'd reverse time and had it this way up. It's nothing like that. And this is an absolutely huge constraint on the Big Bang. So whatever it is that produced the Big Bang in such an extraordinarily special state was not time-symmetric physics. Because if it was, it would have given us the much more likely situation of this great mess. And so to me, one of the huge mysteries is to explain the very, very special initial state of the universe. And I don't, this is the thing which I feel that cosmologists hardly take seriously enough. Now, what was, the nat what was the nature of this very special initial state? Well, I think to explain that, I want to say something about electromagnetism, because I think it's quite useful as an analogy. The analogy between electromagnetism and gravity is quite a helpful one. So in electromagnetism, OK, Faraday and Maxwell, basically, we have um, two things which are the ingredients. One of these is the field, the electromagnetic field. That's the electric field and the magnetic field. And here I've got the electric field with these represented by these arrows, and there's a charge, or you might have a current going around, and these arrows now represent magnetic field. Well, these are sort of put together into this thing called F, which is called the electromagnetic field tensor. But there's also a thing called J in the, in the business, which is referred to as the charge current vector. Here's a charge, and there's a current. And these things are lumped together into J. J is the source. F is the field. So think about that. This is the way that electromagnetism works. And there are these very beautiful equations that Maxwell found to relate these things to each other. Now, what's the situation with gravity? Well, I want to say we have to think, bring another number of ways you can make an analogy, but the one that's most relevant to general relativity, and which to me is the most important, is to bring in Einstein's principle of equivalence, or Galileo's principle, if you like. Here's Galileo dropping a big rock and a little rock from the Leaning Tower. Whether he did or not is not the point. Uh, and here we have them falling together. And here I have a little insect sitting on the big rock looking at the little one. And it's as though gravity wasn't there at all. Since they fall together, the insect sees, seems to see that there is no gravity. Well, now we have this experience that astronauts, of course, um, and there's some futuristic space station, and the, 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 even though the Earth is sitting right there, they seem to fro float freely as though there were no gravity. It's just the same as the insect on the rock. So you have to think about gravitation in a slightly different way in Einstein's theory. It's not a force. You think of it as this sort of distortions, if you like, or, or Einstein interprets this as a curvature of space-time. And that's kind of a difficult idea to grasp, but it wouldn't. The thing about I want to, to stress is it's something you can actually see directly. So if you want to see an electric field, you can, well, if you want to see a magnetic field, you can put iron filings, you see, and you can see them pointing. You can see it right there. So it's a very nice way of seeing a magnetic field. Electric field, OK, you could have little dipoles or something. You could see that just as well, too. So these are things that you can see. But you can also see the two parts of the curvature of space-time that give you gravity. Now, this is originally Newton, but Einstein comes along and reinterprets these ideas. The source, again, is the field. And the, sorry, the source is, is well, it's energy momentum tensor, which is described in Einstein's theory according to a thing called the Ricci tensor. So you have these two parts of the curvature of space-time. Don't worry about what these things actually mean. I'm just going to show you how you can see them. So the Ricci tensor is the source, and the thing called the Weyl tensor is the field. Weyl was a great mathematician, did great things in mathematical physics and in mathematics in the 20th century. And uh, I'm putting the sources in blue and the fields in red. And so you can think of the analogy here between this thing called the Ricci tensor and the charge current vector, and the Weyl tensor and the electromagnetic field. But let me 
show how you can see it. That's really the point. Oh, before I say that, while I've still got this transparency up here, I'll mention one other thing, and that is one of the great achievements that Maxwell made was to understand light in terms of electromagnetism. The electric and, field, uh, and magnetic fields sort of interrelate with each other and uh, produce these waves which we understand now as light. And that's a tremendous advance in understanding. You get similar things for gravity which have not yet been observed directly, although we know they're there from dynamics of double star systems. And these again, you have, you have things called gravomagnetic fields. They're very weak usually. Um, and so you do get these waves as well. That will play a role in what I want to say later, but I don't want to stress that now. The main thing I want to stress is this observational aspect of the tensors, the vial and Ricci tensor. And when I say you can see it, here we have the lensing effect. Uh, light is bent by a source. This is the space-time history of, a, of the sun or something like that. And to distant stars, it causes the, its focusing effect. But I want to think of it here. You imagine the sun was transparent. The sun acts as a lens. It magnifies. And then outside, you see this distortion taking place. And this is really these two effects. So here we have, on the one hand, the Ricci tensor, which is the magnification. That's the lensing effect, which magnifies what goes on behind and the vial part, which is the distortion part. So the field you see in distortion of an image, whereas the magnification is the source part. So when I say you can see it, you sort of could if you could. Well, this was the first good test of general relativity with Eddington's trip um, to the Isle of Principe, where he actually observed this um, lensing effect. But now, in uh, cosmology, it's become a real important tool in observational cosmology. And I just want to show you a couple of slides to show it's really quite dramatic. Um, I th yes, let's put it. Right there. You can see, if you, you can either, you can do this two ways. You can either do a lot of very complicated statistics. See, what we're trying to see is whether you can pick up this distortion here. Now you see, one of the troubles with galaxies is they're already elliptical and that sort of thing, so how do you know it's distorted or not? It might just be like that. Well, you can't tell with an individual galaxy, but if you look at lots and lots of them, you can do statistics on it. You can either do statistics, or if you're lucky, you can just look at it. And here's a nice example, you can actually just look at it. Trouble with this picture is I've seen it so many times that I've lost, so I can't see it anymore. But I hope you can, that there is a sort of effect of stretching around here. See, in the middle, is some, one of these gravitational lenses, and it's causing these distortions out here. And that is the effect of vial tensor. Look at this thing here. You see, that's not real. That's the vial tensor stretching out. Where's a good one? I don't know if you can see my pen here. But that one down there is not really like that. It's stretched out by the lensing effect of something in the middle. And you can see that from the, the general tendency for these rings to take place like that. And if you don't believe that one, uh, a good one to look at is this one here, where you see this huge arc like that. Well, it's because you get these things lined up very accurately with the, the lensing source in the middle and something right behind it, which has got stretched out by this lensing effect. So you're seeing the vial curvature. The vial curvature is really out there, and significantly out there uh, to give you a good way of actually measuring densities and things. It's a, it's a wonderful new tool. Of, how to do astronomy. And this is the space-time picture of what's going on at the bottom here. OK, so it's out there. And that's the vial curvature, which is the gravitational field. And well, I want to say, how do you characterize the special nature of the Big Bang? Well, the Big Bang was special in that there wasn't, it wasn't gravity running around. There wasn't much gravity. So that means there wasn't much vial tensor. And so this is the sort of thing I want to say here. This is merely a hypothesis now. I'm going to say, as a hypothesis, let's say that singularities in the past, whatever they were like, have to have been with the vial curvature zero, or very small. Whereas the ones in the future, the vial curvature goes wild. And the ones in black holes, in fact, that's true. 
So that would be consistent with the pictures that I've been showing you here, with singularity in the past having zero vowel curvature, just like the standard regular models of the Big Bang, and in the future they can run wild. And that could drive the whole second law of thermodynamics. So in the form that we see it. You see, the second law is not just saying the rent entropy was low in the beginning, it's saying it was low in this very particular way that gravity was not thermalized, if you like. Gravity was very special. And then so I'm saying a hypothesis is let's say that initial singularities have to be like this. One of the troubles with that is mathematically it's an awkward thing to try and specify. There are lots of different ways you could say what it means. So it's an awkward thing. However, my colleague Paul Todd has adopted a very nice way of saying this, which is different. And here I've put, in fact, you see, when you put this constraint on it, it gives you a, a, a very low entropy in the early universe, which is at least telling you that the probability of finding a universe in this very special state initially was something like no greater than one part in 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 123. Now that number is a ridiculously large. In other words, the specialness was ridiculously special. Because if you tried to write that down, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and put a 0 on each proton in the observable universe, you'd get nowhere close. So it's much, much bigger than that. In other words, the probability of finding that initial state in that form is much, much smaller than that. I mean, it's incredibly special. So we need a good reason for it. Um, and it comes from the Bekenstein-Hawking black hole formula. I won't bother with that at the moment. But let me give you Paul Todd's way of formulating the vial curvature hypothesis. And it's a very nice way of doing it, in my view. Here we have a black, uh, we have a model of the universe like we have on the other side here. Looking at the beginning, looking at the black Big Bang. And what I'm going to do is something very much like these Escher pictures. Well, let's take this one here. I'm going to do a conformal trick. I'm going to expand. Well, you see, this is the other way around. Here I'm squashing infinity down to make a nice smooth boundary. But you can do the trick the other way and stretch it out. So think of this boundary as very much like the, the boundary of the picture over there. So here we have the singular Big Bang. By stretching it out, you can make it nice and smooth. At least that's the conjecture, you see. That is the hypothesis. Let's suppose that the universe was such that the Big Bang was such that you could stretch it out and it formed a nice smooth boundary in the conformal sense. Now, like over here, I'm saying if you were using conformal geometry, you could step right outside of this picture. But if you're using, looking at the metric, the scales of things, you, you, that really is the edge. So it's like that here. So Paul Todd's proposal is to say, OK, let's formulate the hypothesis to say that you can extend the conformal geometry to something beyond. Now, it's supposed to be just a mathematical trick. Now, a mathematical trick, you could say, well, this is just a nice way of saying it. You say, it's a nice way of saying that you have the right kind of smoothness at the beginning. It's not saying there's anything there. It's just that it's a nice way of expressing the mathematics. And that's the sort of thing mathematicians like doing. It's not, uh, uh, it's not that new an idea. However, you can perhaps go further than that. And I hope you can see what I've read here. Near the Big Bang, energies get so great that particles become effectively massless. So the energies get bigger and bigger than any particles we know. Maybe it's just that bigger than the Higgs energy we need to go with people talk about in terms of the LHC and so on. But exactly what energy it becomes, uh, that mass becomes irrelevant, isn't important for what I'm going to say here. But there might well be, it might be valid to say that energy becomes, um, that mass becomes irrelevant. That, uh, let's, oh, I've, I'm going to show you this picture here. That's it here, I'll put that on this side. Remember we had light cones. I didn't finish saying what light cones are good for. They're good for telling you the causal properties, but the other thing they're good for, is, or the metric, if you like, is good at telling you how clocks, rates of clocks. So here we have the history of two clocks, 
zipping by in the light cone. And these are the different surfaces representing the first tick of the clock, the second tick, the third clock. They're identical clocks, but because of relativity, um, the, the first tick takes place on these different surfaces here. Now, the metric thing, which uh, is what des describes the sp spatial and temporal geometry of space-time, has ten components per point. Now, nine of these are telling you where the light cone is. Only one is telling you a scale, which is, roughly speaking, telling you how crowded these surfaces are. So nine of them are telling you um, the uh, light cones, and one more is telling you the scale. Now, I've got to find one of my earlier transparencies. Here we are. <coughs> so you remember I had these pictures before. Now I want to say, let's complete them by putting in the scaling. So you put these surfaces in, which represent where the ticks of clocks would be, and here we have the metric characterized by these pictures. Now the difference between this picture and this is only one component per point. This is the conformal geometry. This is telling you angles. The light cones give you the conformal geometry. This is the one more component which gives you Einstein's metric, which for which general relativity uh, it depends upon it. But if you're only interested in conformal geometry, that's the light cone geometry. And it's a perfectly good kind of geometry. It's just a slightly weaker geometry, only a slightly weaker, than Einstein's general relativity's geometry. There is a kind of curvature which applies to this kind of geometry. That curvature is exactly given by the vial curvature. And that's what we want for gravity. So in some sense, it's, it's telling us what we need to know if we're interested in gravity. The other point I want to say is that clocks, well, how do you build a clock? Well, basically, to build a clock, you need mass. And this comes down to uh, very basic formulae. These are two very fundamental formulae. Einstein's E equals mc squared, that everybody knows, of course, and Planck's E equals h nu, which was almost as famous. They both tell you that the energy equals something, and therefore we can eliminate E between these two formulae. And that tells you that this frequency, which is nu, is basically the same as the mass. So if you have a clock, or if you have a single particle which has got a mass, it determines naturally a frequency along its world line. And that frequency is absolutely fundamental. It comes from combining these two basic formulae and simply the speed of light and Planck's constant. But if you don't have any mass, if there's nothing around except photons and things like that, or effectively, if the mass has become irrelevant because things get so hot, you, don't, you lose the ability to make clocks. And so the geometry of relevance to physics is the conformal geometry. That requires some thinking about, but that's the basic idea here. And so what I'm saying is that when we get close to the Big Bang, it's not so stupid to have this picture like this, because as far as the physics is going on in this world, that boundary there is is sort of something you could imagine physically extending behind. All right, just keep that in mind. And now I want to say, well, what's on, what, what would, could be on the other side then? Well, now I want you to think about the remote future instead. Now, what's the remote future in that? And now I have to bring in the cosmological constant, otherwise it wouldn't work. So now I'm very glad there is a cosmological constant because this whole idea depends on it. And again, you have a boundary. And that boundary is now even more like what you had here, because it does represent infinity. So if you want to get a finite boundary, you have to squash it down, just as we've squashed down these angels and devils to make that boundary look regular. But how I, now I'm squashing down the whole universe. This depends on certain things. What do we expect in the remote future? We expect a lot of matter to collapse into black holes. And eventually, the expanding universe cools to lower than the black hole's Hawking temperature. Well, that has to bring in another idea, I'm afraid. And what happens to black holes, according to Hawking? Well, they do radiate. They have an entropy, and correspondingly, they have a temperature, a very, very low temperature. But when the universe expands, it will get down to cooler than the temperature of this very cold black hole. And 
that, when that happens, it will start losing energy, the black hole will shrink, and ultimately it goes off with a pop. I'm saying a pop, not a bang, because although it's pretty nasty if this went off in this room, it might bring the ceiling down and kill a few people here, so that's a good thing it's not going off in this room. But as far as astrophysics and cosmology is concerned, it's trivial. So it's a pop, not a bang. And it doesn't matter how big that thing starts with, it always is about the same size in the end. However, it takes an incredible length of time before that happens. You have to think in terms of a Google years. That's 10 to the 100 years for the big ones in galactic centers. Okay, 10 to the 66 years for a solar mass black hole and 10 to the 90 years for a galactic one or probably big ones might easily get up to something like 10 to the 100 years. So you've got to think of that kind of time scale. Okay, I'm thinking, thinking big here. So I'm thinking of that kind of time scale. And in that kind of time scale, where are we? Um, I want the other one. That's over here. In that kind of time scale, um, everything is effectively massless again for a different reason. Okay, there are things to worry about here, and I'm not going to go into that now. But uh, certainly for the most part, the contents of the universe would be massless. And so again, you have trouble with building clocks. So I'm trying to say is that the universe again becomes a conformally interested only in the conformal structure after about Google years. And another way of saying this is, well, it's one of the reasons that I started thinking about this idea, as I was thinking about how boring the universe seems to be according to modern cosmology. OK, it's pretty interesting now, but after the, you wait, I mean, we've got this infinite period of, of nothing interesting happening, especially when all the black holes have gone. I couldn't think of anything more boring than sitting around a black hole and waiting it for, for it to go pop. It seemed to be about the most boring thing I could think of. But anyway, that's not really a, a physical argument, but it did seem to be. I thought then, well, it's actually not so boring, because who's going to be around there anyway? Not us, but just photons and things. And it's pretty hard to bore a photon, because a photon doesn't experience the passage of time. You see, from right from the beginning to the end, it's zip, and it's there, you see. It does, doesn't experience that passage. Are you from my pictures that I had behind? Well, let's, you can remember the times. The, the, if you had a clock, which was trying to, uh, a, clock which, a photon which was trying to be a clock, you see, its first tick is right at infinity on this line. The first tick of that photon clock is, is right out at the very end. So photons don't get bored by this universe. They just go zipping right through. So you see, you can see where I'm going here. I'm trying to suggest that maybe the uh, the end of the universe, that's infinity really, is the same as the beginning of the next eon. So here are our eons now. That's the previous eon. I don't know if I can get these things to fit properly. Oh, that's why I'm having trouble. And the other reason is I've got it backwards. <laughs> okay, this is, the, this is our eon, say. And then the remote future of this will be glued on to the Big Bang of the next universe. And so the suggestion is that that's the way we should think about the universe. And I, I said a lot of things here which I'm going to have to come back to, so I'll leave that for a moment. Here we have the conformal way of looking at the universe. Big Bang, infinite expansion, accelerating expansion. Stretch that out, it makes a nice smooth beginning. That's the vial curvature hypothesis in Todd's form. The remote future, you can squash it down. There's really no hypothesis there. That's what we expect practically none. That's what we expect that the ultimate universe could be squashed down this way. The crazy idea is that this is one eon of a continually repeating. I'm not saying it doesn't repeat itself in detail, but that's the, the general picture will be to continue in that way. And that is the conformal cyclic cosmology model. Of course, you have to fill it out with details about what kind of equations carry you through from one to the next. But I just want to give you the essential idea here. Now, there are two points I should end with. I said I've run a bit over time, but my excuse was problems with microphones. <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, one of them is there's something a bit funny about this. Because what about the second law of thermodynamics? 
I used to worry that, I used to think maybe the answer is that the phase space gets rescaled or something, but that's wrong. There's a scaling of the phase space which is independent of the metric. It's purely a conformal notion. So that's not it. So what has to be the answer? You see, entropy is going up and up and up and up and up, and suddenly it comes down. How do we understand that? Well, I want to go back to the evaporating black hole and explain these things on the right-hand side here. There is a thing which is known as the information paradox, black hole information paradox, and that is that all the information that went into this black hole suddenly disappears, or almost completely. You see, this could be a galactic scale black hole, and it's just a little pop at the end. What happened to all the information that that black hole was swallowing all the time? Now there have been a sort of three different views that it is actually lost, and Stephen, Haw Stephen Hawking originally suggested this, and I always have supported that idea. He has gone and ratted on me just a few years ago, changed his mind, and said, no, no, it comes back again. But I don't have to change my mind. Um, perhaps it's retrieved, and this is the other view, that it's somehow in the pop, or in subtle correlations between radiation. And people try and make sense of that. The reason they do mainly is they want to preserve a thing called unitarity in quantum mechanics. But it seems to me that unitarity at this level is going to go west anyway, for all sorts of reasons which I can't explain in this lecture, but that I simply don't believe that. Or maybe there's some final nugget or remnant, as it's referred to, which contains all the information, even though somehow it can be a little tiny thing at the end. And that has various problems with it too. So I think it is lost. Why do I think that, and why do I like it to be lost? That's really the main point. Well, I'm not going to explain this slide, I'm just going to talk, and those of you who want to look at it can. But, uh, except it's probably, no, it's not backwards. <laughs> it won't all fit anyway, so never mind. The point is that because the information is lost, and I'm saying it has to be in this scheme, because the information is actually lost, that means that you never violate the second law. It's a subtle thing. You don't violate the second law, but the phase space gets thinned down every time a black hole evaporates. Another way of saying that is, I was saying, how do you talk about entropy? Well, you say you count the number of different states, microstates, which go to make a macrostate. And if you have two of them, and they're independent, then the number of ways of this, the number of ways of doing the pair has got to be the product of the number of ways of doing this and doing this. But since you've taken a logarithm, that means that it's the sum. And that's very nice. The logarithm helps you there. It's telling you that the entropies add up. But the other thing is that if one of these things disappears on you, as it does swallowing all its degrees of freedom, you don't see it on the other one. The other one is, is you don't care whether that one's disappeared on you. But as far as the measure of entropy for the whole universe, you've lost all the degrees of freedom and then the, on the one that disappeared. And so it's a subtle point. The, you don't actually have a, 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 a local violation of the second law ever in this procedure. However, it, you lose degrees of freedom, and that is how you can make sense of the second law. It needs to be th thought about that. But it, it does make logical sense. And so that in the, the type of picture I've been showing you, you can have a, 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 con a consistent uh, second law of thermodynamics as far as um, local measurements of the second law, but uh, on, uh, if you talk about the entire universe, you have to take this into account. Let me talk about something else, which is in a way is more exciting or something. You see, is there any observational signal of this crazy scheme? Well, there should be. You see, here is us looking back. This is the crossover surface, so that represents the Big Bang as we look back and the remote future, as the people in the previous eon uh, think forwards in time. Now, what will be one of the major effects on causing disturbances in this hot Big Bang that we're looking back at, and which the microwave background is a signal of? This will be encounters between black holes. You see, in the remote future, uh, you have occasional collisions. Well, the, as I learned recently, the Apparently, observations on the Andromeda galaxy is it's heading for us a little faster than people thought. So in a few zillions of years, it's going to whack into us. And it may well be that our black hole and its black hole will have a close encounter. If they do, they may swallow each other up. 
or they may simply whiz around, spiral around, and produce vast amount of energy in the form of gravitational waves. I mentioned gravitational waves. Here's where they come in. So this is the picture. They're, they're spiraling into each other. Whoomph! There comes this vast emission of gravitational radiation. Now this, although the vial curvature goes to zero here, the derivative across the surface is not zero, and that will affect the matter density of the new material which has to appear in this scheme. I can't get into the details of it, but you would actually expect to see temperature differences of this kind owing to these black hole encounters. What would they look like? Well, here is a sort of nice analogy. Think of a pond, and it's raining. Each drop of water makes a little ripple which comes out. That's like the black hole encounters, and this is the ripple coming out like that. And so by the time you get to crossover, this ripple will have reached a certain region. Now, it stops raining at a certain point here. That's when all the black holes have gone. And you look at a pond when it's been raining a little while back. What do you see? We just see ripples all over the place. But if you're clever enough, and you can do statistical analysis, you might be able to see if it's made up out of these what would look like circles in the microwave background, do we see them? Are there circles in the microwave background uh, indicative of something like this? Well, when I was in Princeton a year ago, I asked David Spurgle, who's an expert on these things, and I said, has anybody ever seen an effect like that? And he said, no, they haven't. But that's not surprising, because nobody's ever looked. So, uh, it, it, but he said, then, then he, that, that seemed to me quite encouraging. But then he said, and I'm not sure whether I was encouraged by this or not. He said, it wouldn't be hard to do it. <laughs> now, that was a year ago. Uh, I didn't hear anything for about a month, you see. He was going to have a look. And he said, if he doesn't have time, he'll give it to a student. So he gave it to the student, who then, Amir Hajian is a student who looked at these things. And he started doing an analysis. And I kept saying, have you got any results yet? I'm giving a talk on this stuff, and I'd like to know, you see. And then when finally he did, this is several months ago, and he gave me all this data with these graphs and things like this, and I couldn't make head or tail of them, not being an expert in this area. Well, they looked pages and pages of things looking rather like this. You see. And, uh, well, you see these, I should explain that this is, a, this is the sort of Gaussian curve in the middle here. It's a parabola, really, here. And it, usually you're looking for things which are on the curve, you see. That was, means your, your theory is working because you've got a curve and the points are on it. But here you're looking for things which are not on the curve. That's the, that's the point. And there are these, there are a lot of spurious effects which took a while to get rid of and they're not there. But then you see there are various tendencies, deviations from the shape of the curve. And some of these looked that were really not there. And then there seemed to be an effect which was still there even afterwards. And so I said, is this real or can you think of some other explanation? And he said, well, no, I can't, but maybe it's just something spurious to do with the galaxy and so on. So then I thought, here's an idea. Why don't you twist the sky? So you actually do the whole analysis again on give the sky a twist like this. It doesn't change the areas, but it changes circles into ellipses. And that means that if it's real, these circles will look like ellipses, and they sh the effect should disappear. So he twisted it by one amount and by another amount, a little, a little amount and a big amount, and they were all color-coded. And then I saw, this was the last September or something, I looked at this, and I saw, not just in one thing, a general tendency with this thing. The green one would be the furthest out, so that seemed to be the biggest effect. The red one, smaller, and the blue one, practically no effect. And there were several things like this. And so then I thought that seemed encouraging. And then I look at the bottom where it's just a color coding. And it said the red ones are the circles, the green ones are a little bit of a twist, and the blue ones are lots of twist. And I thought, surely you've got the color coding wrong. <laughs> because the green ones were systematically off the curve. The red ones, a little bit closer, but still significantly off. And the blue ones, no effect, really. And that was again and again, graph after graph after graph. So I said, look, haven't, you sure you haven't got the colors wrong? And he said, no, they're right. And then I looked back at earlier data it sent me, and yes, they are right. And this doesn't make any sense to me. Or at least it didn't until I wondered about something. Remember, we've been seeing gravitational lensing effects which make circles look like ellipses. So maybe 
there are irregular mass distributions out there which are making these circles look elliptical. And that's why the green ones look better than the red ones. And it only has to match in certain parts of the sky, and maybe that's what you're doing. So I said, why don't you do this and this and this and this? Well, he said, well, look, I'm trying to apply for a job, and I really can't look at this anymore now. <laughs> so I'm afraid I'm leaving you with this somewhat of a conundrum. I don't know the answer. Thank you very much. <laughs>